which is the strongest type of chemical bonding is a very common question asked by chemistry students and unfortunately for them it's actually a question that's impossible to answer so this video we're going to try and explore some of the reasons why that is the case and the first reason is simply because well it depends on the elements or ions involved in a particular type of bonding so if I consider the three main types of bonding ionic covalent and metallic and look at a couple of examples in each for example in ionic I might compare cesium iodide and magnesium oxide and the strength of the ionic bonding in those and actually find there's a huge difference cesium iodide has considerably weaker ionic bonding compared to magnesium oxide so we can't simply say that all ionic bonds are the same strength an example in covalent bonding might be to compare the iodine iodine single bond and the nitrogen nitrogen triple bond and again I find there's a huge difference in the strength of those particular bonds so I can't again say that all covalent bonds are the same strength and the same is true of metallic bonding so if I compare the metallic bonding in sodium with that in lithium I would find again there is a significant difference between them so as a start point there's no way of comparing uh, a particular type of bonding with other types of bonding also if I were to try and make some general claims we find that there's not really a single metric that I could use to compare the different types of bonding so what do I mean by that well when we're talking about ionic bonding for example we tend to use data to do with lattice enthalpy or sometimes melting point to compare the strength of ionic bonding in different substances and what's that data related to well what I'm doing I'm taking an ionic compound which is normally a metal and a non-metal uh, in the solid state and I'm seeing how much energy is required to turn that into gaseous ions and that won't apply to covalent and metallic substances in covalent bonding if we're comparing the strengths of those bonds we tend to talk about bond enthalpy uh, what's bond enthalpy related to well it's related to taking a particular type of bond and seeing how much energy is required in order to break that bond and form gaseous atoms and in metallic bonding well metallic bonding actually the comparison uh, comparative metric we use is actually melting points of metals and what are we doing in that particular process well I'm taking a solid metal and I'm heating it and seeing at what temperature it turns into a liquid so because each type of bonding has its own metric for comparing the strength of those bonds uh, it's kind of difficult to make a comparison between them the third factor is well if we were to try and use melting point as a metric for all of them we come across uh, firstly some problems with covalent substances so for example compounds like uh, elements like diamond and graphite uh, which are giant covalent or covalent network substances here's diamond for reference well melting point would actually be useful because if I want to melt diamond I do need to break covalent bonds so it would tell me something interesting however if I try and do that experimentally what we actually find is diamond and graphite sublime uh, you turn straight from a solid into a gas instead of melting if we're doing it at normal atmospheric pressure so for that reason if I find data on the melting point of diamond and graphite uh, we find that actually those experiments are carried out at very high pressures I think somewhere around a hundred atmospheres so it's not really valid to compare that melting point data with other substances also if I was considering some simple molecular substances uh, for example if I were to take ice which is solid water if I melt ice that might be useful information but I'm not actually breaking any covalent bonds so here's a simplified structure of ice I've got individual water molecules they are not bonded to each other with covalent bonds they are held together by intermolecular forces so to melt ice what I'm doing is I'm giving enough energy to overcome these dotted lines these intermolecular forces I'm not actually breaking any covalent bonds so the melting point does not tell me anything about the strength of those covalent bonds 
Now, even if I were to compare melting points with ionic and metallic substances, which would be a valid thing to do, we find there's such a large range in melting points, if I look at the full scale of those substances, uh, that it actually becomes kind of invalid to compare ionic and metallic bonding. For example, if I take uh, hafnium carbide, which is an ionic substance with about melting point about 3,900 degrees, uh, that's super high. And if I take another example of an ionic compound, ethyl ammonium nitrate, we actually find that's an example of an ionic liquid at room temperature. So there's a huge range in values there and lots of things in between. So it becomes difficult to say there's an approximate value for all ionic compounds. Uh, metallic bonding, similar story. Uh, tungsten is normally uh, quoted as the highest melting point of all the metals but compare that to mercury, which is a bit of a, an exception for metals. It's got a very low melting point. But I do, again, have lots of values that fall in between those two, so it's very difficult to make a clear comparison between the strength of an ionic bond and a metallic bond. Uh, fifth and final point that might make this difficult, actually, the types of bonding, uh, the, the classifications of them are not really nice, tidy, discrete packages. Things are not always just one type of bonding. So, for example, if I were to look at this on a bit of a spectrum, and let's consider covalent and ionic, I would find that it's more easy to think about bonding on a, a spectrum or a kind of scale like that, where I might have pure covalent substances on one end, polar covalent, which means they're still covalent, but kind of becoming a little bit ionic. I might things, find things which are ionic substances, but with significant covalent character. So it's kind of some kind of intermediate. And then I might have things that are closer to purely ionic. So some examples of those, uh, pure covalent, I've got two identical elements bonded together. That's definitely covalent. HCl is a polar covalent molecule. So it's yeah, kind of they're sharing electrons, but actually it does start to have some properties of ionic substances like dissolving in water to form ions. Aluminium oxide is an ionic compound but with significant covalent character. And then cesium fluoride is about as ionic as I can get because they have such a large difference in electronegativity. So because my types of bonding kind of exist more on this spectrum, uh, it's difficult to really compare um, with any kind of validity uh, covalent and ionic bonds. We often find things which have effectively a bit of both. So in summary, um, probably in response to the original question, we might think about a better question to ask and something that would be much more appropriate might be something like this. Which combination of elements produces the strongest bonds in each type of bonding? So we're much more interested in comparing within each classification of bonding than we are combining or comparing uh, all three together. So uh, in short, I haven't really answered the question. It's effectively impossible to answer in any valid sense, uh, but hopefully this discussion has given you a bit of uh, food for thought when thinking about why.